Thank you, Sarah. It's a pleasure to be here. I will also say it's been lots of fun to be on campus and to see some of the exciting things that are happening at Iowa State. Um, of course, our focus has been on efforts to improve undergraduate education, but in the process, I've got a tour of campus and gotten to see some, some other things. So, but what I want to accomplish today is to talk a little bit about a few things. The first is what's happening in Washington these days. Um, and when you try and understand what's happening in Washington, it's important that probably you need to understand what's happening in the rest of the country. So I'll talk a little bit about that and give you some context for the environment in which science policy is currently being made. Uh, then I want to talk about something I think is really important. That's the history of our system for support of science. I think this is something that is often forgotten and Harry Truman once said, there's nothing new in the world except the history you don't know. And it's true with science policy, and so I like to remind people from where we came. And then the last part of my talk is gonna be really about why and how to engage, given the context I'm gonna give you about what's happening in Washington, how to engage effectively when it comes to advocating for science, and again, why it's so important. So, let me start with telling you a little bit more. I'm going to come back and tell you about the title here in a second. But before I do that, let me tell you a little bit more about me and AAU. AAU, of course, the Association of American Universities, was founded in 1900. Uh, it was founded by 14 presidents, uh, really to improve uh, U.S. graduate education at the time. There was a feeling that we were not doing so well when compared to our European counterparts. And so these 14 presidents got together and formed AAU. Uh, we currently represent 60 uh, leading US research universities and two in Canada, a few more publics than private. And uh, the primary representatives to AAU are the presidents and chancellors of our member campuses. When it comes to me, I'm vice president for policy at AAU. My career has been one in government relations. Sarah mentioned I worked for the MIT and Michigan and their Washington offices. I focused on research and science policy uh, innovation, competitiveness, and tech transfer. Uh, when I go back home to rural Michigan, where I, where I hail from, and they ask me what I do, well, I could say I'm an advocate lobbying. I, I, in Washington, I say uh, you're nobody until you create your own group, because we get things done in groups. So we spend, I've spent a lot of time in coalitions and building coalitions. Um, I spent a lot of time on federal regulation and, and compliance. I work a lot with Sarah and her colleagues on those issues. Uh, but when I was given this title and moved a little bit out of the Federal Relations Office to, to be this new position called Vice President for Policy, Bob Berdahl, who was our president, former uh, president at Berkeley, thought that A, you could be more proactive and try and get out there ahead of some of these, you know, promote policies that would be advantageous to us as opposed to what we often did was react to what Congress or the administration was proposing to do to us. The other piece of that was that perhaps we should try and anticipate where we could improve. And that brings me to Iowa State today because uh, we, and, and yesterday, because we launched a major initiative to improve undergraduate, the quality of undergraduate uh, STEM teaching and how faculty teach based upon you know, research that we know, uh, much of which has been on our own campuses to improve the quality of undergraduate education. We are also now embarking on a graduate education initiative um, and so that's what I do, but when I, again, I mentioned going back home, when I asked me what, I, what my career has been about, I don't usually say I'm a lobbyist, I don't say I'm an advocate, I often say my, my career has been one in cross-cultural communications, which means I've been in the business of making the work of scientists relevant to the layperson. So I like to talk about the two cultures that I work between. Um, and so uh, first, uh, there's the political culture, and for those of you who ever on Capitol Hill, you know that um, most people don't come from science backgrounds. In fact, the average age of the staffers up there is between 23 and 30. Uh, and they often come from backgrounds like me, because it's one thing I didn't say was I didn't come from a hard science background. I was a political scientist and uh, got my undergrad degree pretty much in political science. Um, then there's so, so, of course, a lot of uh, 
folks also go on to law school are in Washington. Then there's the other um, culture, which you'll see this poor guy who just finished painting on the wall, the department of people who have a certain degree of difficulty putting their thoughts into brief, concise, and unrambling language. <laughs> that is the academic community. And so my life has been spent trying to translate. In fact, when I was, got that job in MIT, they said, do you think that the fact you don't have a science background will hurt you? I said, no, I'm your first line of defense. If you can't explain it to me, then we don't go to the hill. Uh, so I like to define the cultural divide that I, and, and we're gonna come back, because I'm gonna talk about this cultural divide in some, at the end of my talk a little bit further, but I like to um, define it with a bunch of words about how scientists think versus how politicians think. So scientists think in numbers, politicians think in words, scientists are quantitative, while well, politicians, policymakers are, are um, qualitative, scientists are objective, politicians are subjective, uh, scientists are specialists in their fields. Well, politicians have to be somewhat generalist and know something a little about a lot of topics. Uh, scientists base, uh, you know, base their views on facts and evidence. Politicians look at what the public opinion polls are telling them. Uh, one of the challenges for me when I take scientists to the Hill is they hate to make promises. I cannot ever get them to say my research will lead to anything. <laughs> Um, where politicians love to make promises even if there's no way they can ever follow through. Uh, scientists are technical, politicians are political, scientists ask why, politicians ask why should I care. Usually that means what does it mean to my constituents, what's the value back home, I'll talk about that later. Money for scientists equals more research, for politicians it's what they have to do to get reelected. it's a constant treadmill of raising funds. Um, Scientists think long-term, politicians think to the next election cycle, and that's in the House every two years. So they're constantly running for office. The last thing I just say is scientists are often relegated in their, you know, to the science page, but unfortunately science pages are disappearing these days. Uh, well, politicians like to get a lot of press. They sometimes like to be on the front page, I say, then there sometimes they don't. <coughs> so, my title. Why did I call this talk The Lion and the Path? Well, my former boss, my current boss is Mary Sue Coleman, who had uh, been president at the University of Michigan. Uh, but my former boss was Hunter Rawlings, who had uh, been president at Cornell and before that uh, president at Iowa. Hunter um, was great at coming into staff meetings and you never knew what he was gonna, he had the word of the day come and we define a word and you know, its origins. Um, but he was also, uh, one day he came in and he challenged the whole staff uh, in the following way. He said, um, in my senior year at Haverford College, I had a Latin professor. His name was Professor Howard Comfort. And one day out of the blue, and it was all male class, and uh, one day out of the blue, Professor Comfort interrupted kind of unexpectedly and said, Young men, there will be times in your life where you are asked to give public lectures. Sometimes, when you are called upon to do this, the host will insist, weeks ahead, that you provide them with a title. And you will have no idea what your title is, let alone what you're going to say. For such instances, I have the perfect title for you. The Lion in the Path. <laughs> it is perfect title for two reasons said Professor Comfort. First, it sounds challenging and dramatic. Second, it is absolutely meaningless, and when somebody calls upon you to give a title weeks in advance, a meaningless title is a good thing to have. So thus, Hunter challenged us to name our talks, A Lion and Path, and you can go online, by the way, and you can see lots of talks given by Hunter Rawlings, titled The Lion in the Path. So I am doing my you know, I'm respecting his request. I call it the lion path. And uh, uh, I just need to, he, he always said, give Professor Comfort credit, so I'm doing that. There's another reason, though, I actually picked it. It's quite appropriate for what I'm gonna talk about. So <laughs> let's talk about today's lions. And I'm gonna go into detail on all of this, and I think it sets the context uh, for, again, then how we really address some of the challenges both higher education and science, science is facing these days. So um, I, I want to talk about the extreme polarization and gridlock we see in Washington these days. Along with that, what I'm 
increasingly worry about is the increased uh, rural-urban divide that we see in this country as it relates to people's uh, political views. Fake news and alternative facts. Lastly, a growing negative view of higher education. So when I talk to, I talk to a lot of graduate students, a lot of people who are scientists, engineers who want to get into policy, I, I start by introducing this guy. This is Otto von Bismarck. He was Chancellor of Germany from 1871 to 1890. And so you know he has nothing to do with science policy, except he's credited with saying that there are only two things you don't want to see be made, sausage and legislation. So I'd like to say, I'd like to introduce people to what the normal legislative process should look like in Washington, DC. So there you have it, the sausage making factory. Um, the sad thing is it doesn't exactly look like that these days. In fact, this is more um, appropriate for what Washington looks like. It's gotten pretty brutal. In fact, it's gotten so bad, the sausage makers no longer want to be associated with Congress because they actually make sausage and get things done. And you see this quote from the New York Times about the challenge. And what is fascinating about that, of course, that was before we had a Republican Congress. Now we have a Republican Congress. I'll tell you how they're doing in terms of legislation here in a second. But um, you know, in terms of legislative productivity, the reason I say things aren't really working very well and I, um, is that we haven't been able to pass much legislation. So this, this goes out to the 112th Congress. 112th Congress, a Congress being two years, of course, the term of a congressional cycle. Um, 284 laws, public laws were passed. I like to compare that to the 80th Congress, which is where this begins. Uh, this chart that was in the Washington Post, that was 1947 to 1948, 900 public laws were passed. And by the way, that was Harry Truman's do nothing Congress. Have we gotten better? Well, the good news is we're doing a little bit better. So the 113th, they passed 196 public laws. They had a lame duck session, luckily, because that's what allowed them to eke out and beat what was the, if you judge laws as being productive, and I do say, Congress's only job isn't to pass laws, it's to prevent bad laws from being passed, so I do realize that. But the 114th Congress then passed more. Where are we today? We're at 160 laws as of today that have been passed by this Congress. We don't have much time left in this Congress, and the Republicans are in control. So it's kind of fascinating um, the challenges that Congress is having, you know, at least moving legislation through. Why is that? Well, this analysis was done by some political scientists who, who have been keeping this chart and at that website. And it shows the level of polarization based upon crossover voting, the willingness of Republicans to vote with Democrats, Democrats to vote with, with Republicans, and it's a, a particular formula. I won't go into that. But my, needless to say, the conclusion is that Congress is more polarized now than it's ever been, even if you go back to the Reconstruction era. And. Uh, Another way to look at this, and I want to make this chart at some point, is if you would have gone back 20 years ago and put all the members of Congress on the football field, they'd line up and be pretty much in between the 230, the 30-yard lines in the middle of the field. And now they've gone to the outer edges, the middle of the field is bare, and we've lost the moderates in Congress. Uh, in fact, if you look at the number of swing districts, those districts, congressional districts that are really competitive, we've seen a significant decline. This comes from the uh, Cook Political Report from 164 in 1996. That's the president second year that Bill Clinton was elected to the presidency to 72 in 2016. And if congressional districts, which have been largely gerrymandered, are not competitive, what we end up with is we end up with the competition being in the primary. So you actually drive the moderates more to be more conservative on the Republican side and the moderates on the Democrat side have, are forced to become more liberal. Um, I warn people, the problem for that for science is if we're, we've created districts that don't elect moderates, moderates are often the ones who are most willing to listen to evidence and change their views based upon facts. If we elect ideologues on either side, they come with their minds made up, and also not willing to compromise, and that's why we can't get legislation passed. Um, the other fascinating thing is I was always taught my political science classes that after the, the primary and the presidential election, the candidates will move towards the middle to capture the middle. But if you look at what happened this last presidential election, that did not happen. Hillary Clinton was trying to go, you know, capture the, the voters who voted for Bernie Sanders, 
And Donald Trump was going further right to keep on the Christian right. And so they actually moved away from the middle. Why is that happening? Well, a few used to be this was where I stopped. And I said, you know, Congress is really polarized. This is, I think, even more of a worrisome trend. And that is the American public is growing increasingly polarized. And you see the divide and the change from 1994 to people's ideological views and how they align Democrat, Republican today. And there's a growing gap between them. Now, one of the things I would say when you look at why this happens, uh, my belief is people tend to lean one way or the other. And with the advent of things like cable news, they watch the news that tends to align with their views. Even if they're more moderate, they may be pushed. And I tend, being in Washington, I think it's always good. I try and watch both CNN, MSNBC, NBC, and Fox. So I know what different people are hearing because you can have two different alternative views of reality depending on what news you watch, what cable news you watch these days. Um, so it's important to know that this is happening. Now, the other thing though that I think is somewhat concerning is that a lot of these, a lot of that polarization is breaking down along geographic lines, rural areas voting Republican, and urban and suburban areas voting Democratic. And this map also would have looked different if you would have gone back to a Clinton, the Clinton era. Um, David Wasserman, so I mentioned the Cook political report. David Wasserman, who works for um, Charlie Cook and his, his polling firm, has come up with the, what he calls a Cracker Barrel Whole Foods indicator. And essentially what they've done is they've looked at those counties in the United States that have Cracker Barrels and those that have Whole Foods, and then they've aligned who people, which, how the people in those counties voted. And what you see is that 76% of counties with Cracker Barrels voted for Trump, 22% of counties with Whole Foods voted for Obama. If you go back to the election before, it was almost flipped. 75%, something like that, voted for Obama, 20, and then similar numbers. But what's, again, concerning, if you go back to the first election and then look at their data for Bill Clinton, it was only 56% of those um, in, in Whole Foods. It was a very much different split. Uh, who voted for Bill Clinton in this they, so you didn't you had a lot more um, rural areas where they would vote Democratic now so I think that what's really important when we get to higher education I'm going to talk about high, people's views of higher education today but but one of the challenges we have is often that our institutions are located in r urban and suburban areas and the people who see the greatest benefits are the people who live next to our universities. And people in rural areas may not see the value, which then leads to perhaps one of, the, of what we do. And by the way, we are good at bringing, we pull students out of rural areas. And the issue is they probably never go back home. I mean, people like me, I went to Washington, D.C. I never ended up back in Carroll, Michigan, which is very rural. And we see that all the time. So they aren't seeing the benefits directly they have sons or daughters who go to universities, they see that personally, but they don't see it directly. So this is another concerning trend in terms of the, the context. And many of you are probably familiar with the Pew Research poll that came out earlier this year, which asked uh, essentially a question they've been asking for a while is who, who say that colleges and universities have a positive or negative effect on the way things are going in the country. And up until just, you know, 2015, both Republicans and Democrats had a positive view of the impact and value and what universities were doing, but all of a sudden, the last couple of years, that has flipped from almost what was, what is now 58% of Republicans say that and question whether the impact of universities is positive for the future of the country. That's something we all need to be concerned about. What's driving that? I think some of the issues around free speech, the view that, and some of the things you hear, if you do watch Fox, is that universities are not uh, friendly to conservative views. They don't invite them. They, they, you know, we've had conservative speakers try to come on campus, and the perspective has been we, we don't welcome them. I don't think that's true, um, but that's a perception. And then the other problem is affordability. 
Um, and that's both a Democratic and, I mean, when you ask the Democrats what the issues are with higher ed, they talk about affordability. Now, there's some good news, though. I don't want to sound all that bleak, and that the public still largely is positive about the contributions of science to society. Been a slight drop off. There's a slight difference in Republican, Democratic views when you look beyond these numbers, but it's not been that great. So that's good is that science, has, for the most part, has escaped and is not really aligned with the view of higher education necessarily. So this is the context. Keep that in mind because I'm going to come back when I talk about how do we operate effectively to advocate for universities and science. It's important to keep this all in mind. Oh, one other thing. I mentioned alternative facts and fake news. This is a real challenge, too, because people don't know who to trust anymore. And the good news is they do, for the most part, trust science, but you don't know what's truthful and not. And you see these stories on Facebook that um, I see circulated all the time from a lot of my friends who live back home as if they are truthful when, in fact, they are totally made up. And we know that a lot of this probably was happening as related to the last presidential election. So the Trump administration science policy, let me just talk a little bit about what I've seen and where we're at. Um, so we know that there were, there were last year and the first uh, budget, and again this year, significant cuts proposed. The good news is we didn't realize those cuts and Congress has been there, and actually we're doing very well in terms of science funding. I don't know whether the administration, what they'll do next year if Congress continues to fund science, we'll wait and see. Um, we have a lot of positions, not just S&T positions in the government that have not been filled under, uh, under this president and are still waiting. About a third of the, uh, of the major Senate confirmed positions are still pending and nobody's been nominated for a lot of those. One of the positions I know people who care about science is the director and the science advisor. I do warn people, be careful what you wish for. This may be an administration where you're better without a science advisor. Right now, the office, there are 50 plus people working in the office. They're good people. Um, uh, oops, did I do? Oh, there we go. There are good people there. Um, so I, I, um, uh, there's also some positive hope. The Washington Post said that the, one of the serious candidates was a guy named Kelvin Drogemeyer. He's the vice president for research at um, Oklahoma. We know Kelvin. He would be a very good pick. I think he would be good for our community. I'm not sh I wonder if it would be good for Calvin, because people who've gone to the administration right now um, have had mixed results in terms of what, how they fared coming out. Um, some areas of research are under attack. There are many that aren't, but the ones that are really under attack are applied energy research, anything with climate in it. Uh, but I do, I do caution people, because I am one who does not believe there is a war on science. There's a war on certain areas of science and we can talk about that. A lot of it is that when you look at uh, certain areas, and climate is one of them, the interesting thing is when you look at people's beliefs, and we talked about that they predominantly believe in science, when it comes to issues like climate change, everybody believes in scientists, but they give higher credibility to the scientists that aligns with their ideological views and their values. So they find the scientists that will endorse their ideological views. It's not that they don't want to believe in science. And that's not good, but other areas and the majority of areas actually have not been politicized the same way that climate change has been. So it's important just to know that, that I don't think science, and if you look at the budget we just got for science and what Congress did in Republican Congress, there's still a lot of support for science. Um, immigration has been a tough one, and we've been dealing with everything from DACA to the travel ban, and I think we are very worried at AAU about the impact that will have on our ability to attract the best and brightest students from around the world. Um, the, you know, there's been other attacks, and I think there's not a recognition. I'll talk more about the university government partnership and some of the concerns there in a second. And then just the extreme uncertainty, the fact that on any given day, depending on what goes across Twitter, uh, our world can change and there can be, uh, we, we would focus on something different. There are some positive things, I think. Um, on regulatory form, I think we have an opportunity this administration to make progress to reduce some of the regulations on research that often uh, cost universities money, but also take faculty's time away from teaching students and, and um, doing their research. I, I don't think we're going to get an infrastructure package. When we do, there'll be some, and certainly we will be pushing for uh, scientific infrastructure to be a part of that. 
There are some strategic tr initiatives that the, the Trump administration has you don't hear that much about, but Workforce for the Future is one where I think we have something to contribute and we need to be there talking about, and things that I see on this campus, the push towards training students to be entrepreneurial and faculty. One of their strategic initiatives is on entrepreneurship. And the, despite the fact they haven't proposed good budgets, the president signed that bill that gave us the increases, which is really positive and none of us would have ever predicted it. So I want to talk a little bit about history. Uh, like I said, I feel history is really important. So I want to take you back to a time before uh, the World War II, a time when our universities didn't actually accept much federal funding from the government, except in agriculture because of the Morrill Act and because of the land, the land grant um, system that was established during the Civil War, also in aeronautics was the other area. Um, those were the two areas really that our universities accepted federal money, otherwise they were concerned that if they accepted federal money, the federal government would tell them how to spend it. So in 1930s, there's a book, a very good book that talks about the debates that happened in my association between the presidents as to whether they would want to start accepting federal pay patronage, and it was quite a heated debate. The money that they did receive came from the Carnegie's, the Rockefellers, the big philanthropists, you know, corporate moguls at the time. The issue, though, was coming out of depression, that money started to dry up. Universities were looking for a place. Enter a guy named Vannevar Bush, conservative engineer from MIT. And I stress the word conservative because he was really dubbed during the war. He started the um, Office of Science and Research Development within the Department of Defense under Franklin Roosevelt. He really led all of the science efforts during the war. But he was a Republican, yet he worked and he was dubbed the unofficial science advisor for Franklin Roosevelt. Gives me hope that Republicans and Democrats can work together in support of science and do good things on behalf of the country if we can just get back to the times when they realized that they had to get past those differences in views. But Bush believed that, uh, well, he started to let government contracts and he didn't feel it was the right thing to bring all the scientists out of the universities coming from a university himself to national labs to do science. Now there were the national labs of course created in the war, but he believed the contract should go to the universities. He was asked by Roosevelt after the success of the war that's in science's role in it, not only relating to the atomic bomb, but also to um, uh, medical advances, blood substitutes, uh, ways to fight malaria, uh, work on things like radar and precision uh, uh, bombs, things like that. Uh, to develop a system for support of science in peacetime. And the result was the report I mentioned, Science on the Frontier, which he uh, presented then to Harry Truman in July of 1945. I also like to talk about Harley Kilgore, though. He was a Democratic, uh, and, and by the way, the report, the primary recommendation of that report was to create one civilian science agency, a national science foundation, to support all of science in the United States, including science, to support the Department of Defense. Harley Kilgore in 1942, he was a, 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 a New Deal Democrat from West Virginia. Interesting fact, for those of you who know AAAS, uh, he beat a guy named Rush Holt, Rush Holt Sr. Uh, for that Senate seat. Rush Holt Sr. had been a U.S. Senator from West Virginia, and Rush Holt Junior, of course, is the CEO of AAAS. Um, Kilgore introduced legislation creating in 1942 a National Technology Foundation. So I tell you this because those two guys actually believed there needed to be a post-war way to support science and technology. They differed a little bit about how to do that. Unfortunately, Bush was supposed to talk to Kilgore and they were supposed to try and reach some agreement, but before he submitted that report and legislation was introduced, he didn't do that. The day after the report was submitted, there was legislation about the House and Senate I introduced to create a National Science Foundation. Kilgore was not only happy. It instigated a, a, a debate that occurred around the NSF. And what were the, what were the issues? Well, do you, how do you distribute funds for science based upon scientific merit and scientific excellence or geographic diversity? Do you give each state a little bit to give to their university? Kilgore believed in geographic distribution. Bush believed in merit. Bush won, that's why we have a merit review system that we ended up with today, which I would say is one of the real hallmarks of the US system. Other countries, like the UK, went more to the block grant system. 
Um, who appoints the NSF director? This was a, a big battle. In fact, it was such a big battle. Uh, well, Bush believed that the National Science Board should appoint the director who headed that agency. 1947, um, Truman vetoed a bill that got passed the House and the Senate because it didn't, the president didn't appoint the director of the National Science Foundation. The compromise on that is the National Science Director is appointed by the president for a six year term. They do not serve as the will of the president, so they are somewhat apolitical. And as you see with France Cordova, she spanned a Democratic and, administration, a Democratic and Republican administration. Fundamental versus applied research. Bush believed that the government's role was to support basic research, not more applied research. Remember, Kilgore supported a National Technology Foundation. He was much more in favor of applied research. Bush won that debate. That is why, we, and with this belief in a linear model, is why we can't get programs that support kind of moving into the valley of death, supported oftentimes by Republicans. That debate continues, and we see it when Budgets are cut for new agencies like the Advanced Research Projects Agency for Energy, which is always comes under scrutiny for representing corporate welfare or industrial policy. Who owns intellectual property? Um, in this instance, uh, Bush believed that the inventor or the university should own it. He lost that debate. It wasn't until 1980 and a Bayh-Dole Act was passed when universities actually got to maintain intellectual property for the grants and the research done funded by federal research. Otherwise, prior to that, it was the federal government and a lot of that new intellectual property sat on the shelf. The last thing is Bush didn't, believe it or not, necessarily think that it was a government's role to support social and behavioral sciences. Something a lot of people don't know, he supported research in those areas, he just didn't necessarily support it. Um, government funding, it wasn't until 1992 when NSF actually created or 1991, when they created a, a social, behavioral, and economic directorate to support social science. Now, the conclusion of all of this is in the five years it took to create the National Science Foundation, the Department of Defense, which had started to fund research during the war, it went and started to fund research to support its mission, led by the Office of Naval Research, then followed by the other services. The uh, Atomic Energy Commission was created and started to fund research to both look at civilian uses of nuclear uh, fission as well for energy purposes as well as the impacts on the human health of radiation and finally uh, the NIH was the National Institute of Health but it merged with the National Cancer Institute to become the National Institutes of Health and it started fund health research so by the time the NSF was actually created its mission got relegated to funding science for science's sake and blue sky research not the research that Bush had envisioned to support the mission of the other agencies in fact, in his biography, you read about it, Bush actually looked at the final NSF somewhat as a stepchild. It was not what he originally envisioned. But the fact that we ended up with a pluralistic system of support for science by somewhat accident has been a hallmark and another strength of our system in terms of getting different scientists who think differently to support different agencies and then the cross-fertilization between that system. So it's really a unique part of what we do. Now, I want to conclude and just go through some slides here. I talk a lot about why it is important to engage right now, given the context, and then how to do it. So I, I like to show this little cartoon because there was a time when I think the scientific community felt, much as it says here, that engaging in policy, you know, you see this, um, there's antimatter, dark matter, and that there's doesn't matter. And there was a time when a lot of the scientific community felt that they were entitled to the funds, just give it the funds, we don't have to talk about, you know, we'll do good things, just keep the money flowing. We live in an environment where that's no longer possible, and that means you do need to engage, and it's not just engage with policymakers, because like I said, what they look at is what their constituents think about what's valuable, and that's how they vote. Um, the other challenge we face is many policymakers don't know much about science. In fact, I like to, uh, to uh, talk a little bit and give you just a perspective of what the current Congress looks like. So here's a profile for you. Um, less than 3% of the members of Congress, of the current Congress, have any background in science or engineering. We have 1.5 physicists, I'll explain, 1.5 in a sec. Uh, one mathematician, one chemist, and unfortunately we just lost our microbiologist, Luis, with the passing of Luis Slaughter, Slaughter which was in about two or three weeks ago. Um, the 1.5 physicists, so we used to have three physicists, three PhD physicists, Rush Holt, Vern Ehlers from Michigan, and um, Bill Foster from Illinois. Uh, Holt and Ehlers retired, 
Foster was the only one left. The Wall Street Journal interviewed him. He said now, and about what's it feel like to be the only physicist in the physics caucus in the US Congress, to which he said, actually, we just elected South Moulton from Massachusetts, and he had a BS in physics, so I count him. I'm not willing to give him quite a full count, because he doesn't have a PhD, but he has a BS, so he's got some background. Uh, eight members have engineering degrees. Uh, uh, 12, 21 have medical degrees. I think one or two of those are senators in, in terms of engineering degrees. Oh, I always make people guess, but 218 have law degrees. The one that I really remind people, which I think gets to the heart, and this used to be flipped, um, but there's only there's 18 members that don't have any education beside, besides a high school education. I always remind people they're very smart politically. They've gone up through the ranks, uh, and they're not, you can't take them for granted. There's 24 that have doctoral degrees in any subject. So when we go to the Hill with, with folks from the university, I was reminded they don't, they, they never worked off of a research grant. They're still paying back their loans uh, from law school. So tips in terms of how to deal in this environment in the context. The first is, one thing I learned when I worked on the Hill, all politics is local. We didn't pay attention if the letter didn't come from the constituents or from at least an institution in the state, it ended up in the trash bin. If it was from the state and from somebody else's district, we'd at least forward it to that member so they could deal with their own constituents. But it, 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 for what we deal with, we need to talk about what we do, but it can't just be about our, what our university does locally. And this is something that the University of Missouri has created where they have, and they can tell a story, and you can go on a map and click by a county or a congressional district. It breaks down multiple ways, and you can see what the university is contributing in that county. So I encourage you to go to the website and look at it. Of course, Missouri has had some challenges lately, and I think part of this is in response to that. Another institution that's got its own problems and challenges is Michigan State, but one thing they've done is they did a road tour through the state, and they created a video. And they went to different towns and they showed people what they were doing in that particular town. And of course, both these institutions are land grant institutions. So it's worth noting that um, you know, one thing that Ohio, uh, Iowa State and other land grants have is extension service. I'm a big extension person, grew up with 4-H and evolved in extension in Virginia. And I think sometimes we can utilize extension in, in ways that are even better, you know, we can, we can, it's the front door at the university, we just need to make sure people know that. Because I'm not always sure people understand that that's an entryway in the university. And the research, and what they're getting from the extension service is research based, based upon what, what comes from the university. The last thing I'll just make a pitch for is there's, well, I'm doing a lot of work with the inst uh, an Institute for Research on Innovation and Science, and they're really looking at local impacts and collecting data from institutions. And they can tell you, um, for the institutions that are giving them data, um, exactly how much money is being spent in subcontracts throughout the state and the nation from a particular institution, which is really valuable when you go and talk to legislators. But you have to make things local. And Tip O'Neill, of course, said all politics is local, but it's also personal. So we've developed some, some graphics at AAU um, that we try to use depending on the member we're going in to talk to them about why science is important. So this is a graphic that we use with uh, uh, an auto dealer who was elected from Pennsylvania to explain why basic research mattered to him. Other people who are on the Armed Services Committee, we might use this illustration of the impact of science um, to soldiers. I think the best examples are, again, where research being done at the university is affecting them personally because either they have a, you know, and health, one of the advantages NIH has is everybody knows somebody who's died of cancer or, or who's had heart disease, and those, those things are very personal. Um, but local things are very personal too, and I think that's a, something we've got to change is try and get out there and explain the value, especially with this growing divide between the rural and urban areas in terms of political views. The other, uh, another thing I often say is language matters immensely. Uh, and, and when we talk about people's values and the fact I already mentioned that oftentimes people's views on science diverge depending on uh, where their values are, when we go out and talk to them about what we have that's valuable to them, we have to know where they're coming from. And people in rural areas are probably gonna see the world differently and see the value, and that's one of the problems that climate change scientists, I believe, have had, is it's not enough just to go and say, don't you understand? And the notion of a deficit, if you look at science communications work, the notion of uh, 
you know, um, what's it, you know, the information deficit, or if you only knew what I knew, you'd agree with me, that's absolutely wrong. People, again, in fact, what we find in science communications is that the more educated you are, the more likely you are to twist scientific facts to meet your political or ideological or value objectives. So it's not just a matter of educating people in STEM. Uh, and I always say we're doing pretty good if you look at funding. This country has been tremendously supportive of science. Language matters, it also matters in what we use. We often talk about basic research. We did some polling a few years ago. You know what the people in the focus group said when we talked about basic research? Why the heck are we doing basic research? We should be doing really tough, difficult research at our universities. <laughs> people don't, you've got to remember who you're talking to. They don't think in the same terms that we think. Another thing is scientists love to talk about data, but in fact, when you're in, in Washington, stories are what drives the place. Anecdotes, personal stories, I often tell scientists, talk about why you care about science. How did you get in? What, why are you personally passionate about what you're doing? Talk less about your data, because they aren't going to care about that. Talk about a story of your field, of something that, you know, since you can't promise what your research will lead to, talk about somebody else who couldn't promise what their research led to, and tell a story about, tell that story, because that's an example. So Jim Cooper, a few years ago, as he's a member from um, Tennessee, came to AAU and AAAS. He said, you know, I'm tired of people like, the, you know, uh, Senator Proxmire and other uh, members coming up with these uh, uh, grants that sound funny. And we really should fight against them. And he proposed an award called the Golden Goose Award. And we kind of looked at it and said, that sounds like a great idea. It sounds like a lot of work. But his idea was, let's find research projects that sounded funny, silly, um, could be made fun of by members of Congress as a waste of taxpayer dollars, and let's, it, that have had an impact. And let's give those people, recognize those scientists. A few years later, when the budget started to get tight, we started to do some research. We started to find some of these stories, so we took him up on his offer. And you see his quote, he often talks, we call him Father Goose because he created this Golden Goose Award I'm gonna talk about. Um, but tell me a fact and I'll learn, tell me the truth and I'll believe and tell me a story and it will live in my heart forever. So storytelling and talking, and this is one of the things he preaches to scientists, is you need to do better about talking about stories. Doesn't mean you include, don't include data in those stories, but you need to better, do better. So we did create the Golden Goose Award. It's been a great vehicle to talk about things that, again, you never would have predicted uh, were gonna be valuable. Uh, we, the first year we gave the award, we gave the award to Charles Towns who invented the Maser became the laser. He was 97 when he accepted the award, came to Washington, um, and uh, he told the story of how his own department chair complained that he was wasting the department's money on the maser. It was worthless, and it was dubbed, even after it was invented, a solution in search of a problem. Another, and perhaps my favorite story from this, is the story of uh, research that was being done by a Duke researcher. They were looking at uh, growth hormones, and, uh, and they were using rats in the study, and they separated uh, out the baby rats from the mother rats, and interesting enough, and this was not what they predicted, the baby rats that were separated from the mothers were not growing at the same rate as those that were with the mother rat. They couldn't figure out why. A graduate student, one of the things that's also great about this is you learn, we had no idea. We, we, we got a nomination for him and one other woman, but then we started talking to people and we learned the full story. The full story was the graduate student who was working for him at the time observed that the mother rats would lick the babies that were left with them quite vociferously and knock them around. Um, went to his advisor, said, you know, I don't know if this has anything to do with it, but maybe we should check it out. So he devised uh, a scheme where he would go and he would take those baby rats that had been separated from their mothers with a lens camming, ca uh, cleaning brush from a camera and he would stroke them like the mother was licking them on a regimented basis. Well, amazingly, the rats grew at the same rate as if they were with the mother. What's the moral of the, what, what's the, the, the rest of the story? The rest of the story is that advisor went to a conference and hooked up with a woman who was studying massage therapy and felt and there was a view that touch stimulated growth in infants but they had no scientific evidence to prove it and the result of that connection was that is why when you have a premature baby you're taught infant massage and it saved billions of dollars and saved lives now you can imagine a member of congress talking about why are we sending rats, rats to the spa. 
But this is really valuable research and telling those type of stories is really compelling and you don't know how many, I mean, when we had the researchers in, there were a bunch of people who just went up because they had had a premature baby and that was personal. So I want to conclude just, you know, why is it important that we engage now more than ever? And why is it important that we tell stories and we get out there and I talk, tell graduate students this all the time, this is really important. And, um, you know, growth in funding is not guaranteed. We did well this last time. There's clearly support. We need to keep it up and make sure that we are also thanking those members. And if you haven't done it, if you're a member and you have a congressman or a senator who voted for that bill, always good to say thank you. It's easier to say thank you than it is to, to complain. And they appreciate it. And the next time we need to get them to fund the bills, it's going to be all that much more important. Um, you know, just as I was talking about, we are still getting waste books. There are still questions about whether the money we're being we're spending on science is being well spent. There's an initiative right now that NIST has launched called the Return on Investment Initiative. They're going to be looking at tech transfer, and are we getting everything for these you know dollars? Are we getting in return? I'm actually quite happy NIST is doing it, um, as opposed to other parts of the administration. I think the new director of NIST understands full well the value, but we're going to need people to respond because we're going to issue a request for information about tech transfer and how it happens and does it work at universities, we need to respond and say why actually it is working pretty well. Um, we need to prevent regulations. There's often comment periods, but the scientific community doesn't get quite as engaged in those as they could. Um, and those are very important opportunities to prevent the government from instituting regulations and we're always on the front end as an association and fighting against those. Right now, given the views of universities and the role that universities play in the support of science in this country because of Vannevar Bush's vision. We have to defend and explain better than we have been the value of our universities. And that means collecting better data, but also getting out and demonstrating to people and engaging directly with people not only in the cities in which our universities are located, but in rural areas as well. Um, we need to talk about how unique our system actually is. That system that Bush devised, where graduate students work off of research grants and get to be trained by the best scientists in the world because they stay at their university and aren't pulled into a federal lab, um, is really unknown. And unfortunately, a lot of our own scientists and graduate students don't understand how unique that system is. That's why we were able to attract the best and brightest students from around the world here. Because that's the only place you could do that. And now we're at risk of losing with some of the policies on immigration and some of the views. And I can tell you that Canada, talking to our Canadian colleagues uh, at the SRO meeting here recently, they're, they're looking to take advantage of, and if you look at their recently uh, announced research chairs that they give, there's a bunch of Americans moving back to Canada to work right now at the research universities. And the last thing, which is the real reason we need to do this, is to ensure that policy is based upon evidence and technical knowledge and scientific facts especially in an era when people are not sure what the facts are, we need to be out there making sure they know. So with that, thanks for your attention. <laughs> I probably way over time. Um, I can take a few questions, I think. Um, Sarah, do I have time for questions? Yes, sure okay. <laughs> One more thing I just wanna say, um, there's the AAU website. Uh, I also promote, and I'm co-chair of a group called Engaging Scientists and Engineers in Policy, and that's for scientists and engineers at any level, uh, because we, we are trying to provide resources to people who want to engage and want to know how to better do that, training resources, and we also get involved, we have an online community where people can, if you're interested in policy and getting involved in discussions, um, through the AAAS, uh, their new communications trellis platform, we have a a site, and if you go to the website there, you can find out how to become involved in ESEP, as we call it. So questions? Yeah, I don't know I have an easy answer to that. I mean, uh, but I think you see a little bit of that happening as it relates to what's going on with the gun discussion now. Is I think the only way you fight against that is really to get people 
And if you look at people's views on climate, when you really dig down, I mean, there's still a lot of people who believe there's an issue. They may not, they may question whether it's man made. At one point, before about 2008, we we're actually winning. People forget the House of Representatives passed a bill to tax carbon, a cap and trade bill. What happened? The fiscal climate kind of went south then. People became much more worried about their pocketbook and whether they were gonna have a job. And those corporate interests picked up on that and basically said, this is gonna be bad for the economy if we do things and we tax in the, the vote in the Senate couldn't get through. So I think part of it is going out and explaining to people how this will, is impacting them already, but in terms that probably don't mention climate change because it's just a political lightning rod. You know, we see the budgets and I know people get really upset because certain words may be struck from budgets, but I often say there's two reasons to do that. One is because there is a political attack on climate change. Another is because the people who care know that if you change that before the Obama administration, a lot of the, a lot of the current words that were climate change weren't climate change, but they changed it because they saw a benefit of calling it climate change because the Obama administration had an, had an initiative on climate change. So if you were climate change, you probably got more money. But some of these things, extreme weather, uh, could be called climate change, but you probably better to change it back to extreme weather. People get extreme weather. And that's where I say, you've got to think about the people you're talking to and what their value, what matters to them, because climate change may not matter to them as much as the fact that they've got, you know, there's a drought or there's fires or, you know, that they're, they're, they see the seawater rising because they live by the shore. That's what we need to do is figure out again, this gets right back to, to all politics is local, but what matters to you is local too. And you have to bring it back to a personal level of what matters to people. And that's where the scientific community, I think, lost out. And some of the things, what, what was totally lost in this last debate was the economic value of renewable energy. In fact, when I go home to my, what, what used to, is still farmland, and the fact that what I look at is a wind farm, uh, you know, but that didn't get, that wasn't what won the day. I mean, it was the coal miners in West Virginia. And what are we doing to help the coal miners? Well, what are we doing in rural areas where, you know, I mean, I look at the economic value of that. I've gotten stuck behind these large turbines driving home to my mother's house. <laughs> Not, I will say, don't try and pass those turbines because once you go past the first one, there's two more in front of it plus the poles that hold it up. Uh, but so, so that's, that's my answer. So we, I think we need to think of different language. We need to think about how we talk and, and we need to recognize you need to start where people are at. I don't think it helps. I mean, I'm a big fan of the extension service. Like I say, I grew up with 4-H. I ended up, uh, when I landed in Arlington, Virginia, um, led a 4-H club, um, basically in a low-income housing complex with Southeast Asian refugee kids from Laos, Cambodia, Vietnam, right off the boat, teaching them gardening. Um, I, I, think, I think that, you know, as you've seen agents, less and less agents, I mean, but I also think that extension has had a hard time adapting to the times. Sometimes because it's been, not here I, as I understand it, but in some places it's been stuck in the College of Agriculture. I'm not saying agriculture isn't important, but it's not the only thing. And unfortunately, some of the things that the university can contribute to local communities get lost because that isn't housed in where, in the specialty of the College of Agriculture. And unfortunately, other parts of the universities have sometimes seen that as that's the College of Ag and that's what they do, but we don't have really a, an outreach mission. Um, I'm a big, proponent of the fact whether it's through extension, extension is an already existing vehicle to get out and get to those local communities, or whether it's through other mechanisms that uh, researchers need to try and solve local problems and think about their states and communities. One of my collaborators, uh, on a, on, I co-wrote a book on science policy, Homer Neal, uh, once was, when he was VP for research at Michigan, said you know, one of the challenges, he'd he get these calls from local counties Next, neighboring counties, county, counties to Washington County to the university and ask for faculty help on a problem. It might be a water problem, it might be a local you know, issue that they were trying to deal with. And he could get people who were working in Africa and were dealing with similar problems, but they couldn't help the local community nearby. 
And so I think we do need to, in this time, need to think about our value, particularly state institutions. How do we even do a better job connecting to those communities and talking to folks out there? So I'm, like I say, I think Extension has taken a lot of hits. And it's, I think it, it, those universities that are able to revitalize Extension and also think differently. I'm very impressed with what Missouri has just announced and their Extension director. They're doing some things in health. I think things like the opioid crisis, those are things that can be addressed and the university has a lot to contribute and maybe the extension can play an important role. So, I think we need to figure out how to change that. You asked me how to do that, I don't know. I mean, I've been here and spending a lot of time just about an area where we know that policies say that teaching and research are of equal value, but we know when, when the rubber meets the road, it's not how review committees totally look at it. Uh, but one of the things that I think is unique and one of the things we said as AAU was, we need to try and change that. And one of the areas we've been trying to do that is, is you know, is institutional change in how we evaluate teaching. When you get into engagement, it gets even tougher because the issue is people on review panels for promotion and tenure like numbers, they like data. And when you talk about how you measure the value of an engagement, you could engage, but you could do it really poorly. Does that count as well as good engagement? How do you measure what a good engagement is? Uh, is it just number of people contacts? But I do think we, it shouldn't be penalized and it should be recognized some way. And there's a lot of talk, I was telling Sarah earlier, that there's a group of foundations right now that are talking to universities, um, they are talking to um, disciplinary societies, they have a mission to give funding to universities and to individuals that are promoting public engagement on science and getting out there and doing those things. And I think in a, about a year you'll see some major funding coming from the philanthropic community to try and promote and what they want to do is they want to understand how do we move the ball in terms of the culture. We don't want to just fund a few individuals who are doing this, but how do we actually do exactly what you're saying is start to get at these um, really difficult cultural issues so that those things are recognized. And there's a lot of areas I think that we need to recognize are important to scholarship, important to the advancement of science, open data, but engagement as well as you know, um, economic development which is, and we have some universities that are now starting to incorporate your work, your entrepreneurial work, patents, startups, those things into promotion tenure decisions. It's gonna be an uphill battle, but I do think it's really important. With that, <laughs>